live? Let's see here. I think I'm live. Wonderful. Awesome. So, this is... Oh, is it going? I don't know. Is it going? Yeah, it looks like it. All right. Awesome. So, yeah, this is the last stream before Christmas. So, happy holidays, everybody. I hope you are all enjoying... Ooh, sorry. <laughs> it was a bit of a... It was a bit of a hiccup while talking. It was... I don't know. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway, where was I? Yeah, last stream before Christmas. I hope you're all enjoying the holiday season. I know I have been. I have been cooking a lot this past week. I uh, This year I'm doing homemade gifts for my family, and I'm doing family recipes. So I've got, I've got to make eight dozen tortillas. I've got to make nine pounds of chorizo. And I'm making, I don't even know how many frijoles. But I'm loving it. I love cooking, especially Mexican food. Um, and yeah, so yeah, that's kind of what's new in my area in terms of personal life. But that's not what we're here for. We are here for a live music lesson. But before I do that, I do want to make a quick announcement of something really cool that a lot of you already know about, but many people may not. And that is that I have finally launched the Tabletop Academy. If you go here, go to my website, go to Academy. What this is, it's a free music school that I have plans for. I've got all kinds of visions. Right now, there are four classes available and Discord channels for each of them. Uh, like one Discord channel, but like, uh, like chats for each of them. You can take a class on harmony. You can take a class on melody writing. And there are two classes on orchestration. One on instrumentation, like getting to know the different instruments and how to use them. And orchestration number two, which is actual arranging practices and stuff. So four classes, I've got a bunch of more that I want to do. And again, the important thing is these are 100% free. All right, so my own personal experience with music school being forced to drop out because I couldn't afford it. Um, and then finding out that quite a few students have the same issue. That only the school I went to, only 63% of students graduate on average. So it's very big, it's a passion of mine, music education. That's why I do all of this stuff. So go to my website, tabletopcomposer.com, find the Academy tab under here, and yeah, sign up, 100% free, take all the classes you want, any order you want, however the order I do recommend is harmony first, then melody, then orchestration, all right? If you are brand new and this is something like you haven't done a lot of studying yet, that's what I would recommend. But that is my announcement out of the way. But today, today's topic, I had a lot of really good topics requested of me. But today's topic that we're going with is a discussion on structure. And basically, I've been getting the same question by a lot of people in comments. Is you can come up with an eight bar idea. You can come up with a simple melody, but you don't know what to do from there. All right. And a lot of you get stuck. All right. And you're not sure what to do next. All right. And that's what we're going to learn about today. All right. We're going to learn what structure is, how it can help you get past this. And then we'll learn a little bit of kind of a tool for how to create uh, secondary melodies or third melodies or whatever you want to do. Uh, welcome. Uh, Jack, that's kind of good. That's, thank you. Uh, congrats. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is something that I've been wanting to do for a long time. These are quality courses, people. They are free classes. Uh, it's, at per it's currently in phase one. So phase one means that I'm putting together the classes that I can using videos from my YouTube channel. Uh, so I have over 250 tutorials and videos on my YouTube channel, and I understand that can be a little bit overwhelming at times. So I basically decided, right, if I wanted to teach a class on harmony and I wanted people to watch a certain number of videos on my channel to get through it and learn everything they can about harmony, here are the videos I'd want them to watch. This is the order I'd want them to watch. Here's a bunch of PDFs and articles to fill the gaps and tie it all together as well as assignments for everybody to do to a practice and immediately apply everything they're learning. So far, I think I've got like somewhere between 50 to 60 students signed up across each of the classes and people are loving it so far. I've gotten emails, I've gotten messages, people are loving them. They think they're very good. They think they're high quality, which makes me happy. Uh, so yeah, give, check them out. They're 100% free. You got nothing to lose, all right? So, but, so, Getting back to uh, the topic, because if you're if you're a repeater, if you're a common person in the streams, welcome back. If you're new, welcome. Um, I have got I'm trying a new format because of my ADHD. I get off track very quickly, so I'm trying something new. Starting from this point on, I'm going to focus on the lesson. All right, I'm going to ignore the chat. I'm going to ignore the chat for now. 
We will have a Q&A, but I'm going to ignore it because otherwise I'm going to get sidetracked. I'm going to lose track. And sometimes I don't actually get to the lesson, which I have been told can be annoying to people. Um, so always trying to improve. So from this point on, I will ignore chats unless it's a super chat. Super chats will get immediate responses. Um, but for now, let's talk about the lesson. So the issue that people have been sharing, I think I've gotten like five comments about it at this point, is people are talking about how they get an eight bar idea and they're not quite sure where to go from there. What like, how do you create a secondary theme? How do you build on your first theme? And honestly, the solution to all of this is structure. All right? So musical structure, super simple. The only thing it is, it is the number of different themes that you have and the order that your themes appear in. All right? So, for example, an AABA structure. In fact, I should, probably, should I be writing these down? I'll write this down. All right, so structure equals the number of different themes you use and the order in which they appear in your music. All right, so AABA structure. This has two different themes. It has a theme A and it has a theme B. The structure, super simple. You play theme A, then you repeat theme a sometimes with some change it's up to you um it's they have personal preferences but sometimes I, I i typically try to do a little bit of changes here and there um then after you've repeated theme a to keep things from getting too boring you do theme b all right and then after you've played your secondary theme voila you return to the original theme and you bring it nice and kind of um it's nice and wrapped like a pretty bow on top so structure does not need to be difficult. There are several things that you can get structure from. All right, so you can have traditional structures. All right, these just exist on their own. You can literally Google song structures. All right, in fact, let's do that. I think we did that on stream before, but let's just do song structures. We'll do, we'll do common. Uh, common song structures all right so i googled common strong structures right here intro verse pre-chorus chorus verse pre-chorus chorus bridge course fancy words all that means is you've got the intro you've got theme a your verse you've got pre-chorus which is just kind of a transition into theme b your chorus then verse look at that theme a again pre-chorus which is your transition again chorus theme b bridge that's a theme c it's a new idea then you return to theme b all right, you can find Wikipedia is going to have a whole bunch of them. Uh, you can find there are like countless blog posts, like four song structure types you should know, careers in music. Um, no, thank you. Don't want to know any of that. Can we just get to the thing? All right, yeah, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. These are common structures. So yeah, just look at the stuff. You don't need to think too much about this, all right? You can use more traditional orchestral textures, uh, structures if you want. Things like sonata form or rondo form. Rondo form is particularly popular in video game music. All right, rondo form is the idea that you have a theme A, all right, a primary theme. Then theme B, new theme, all right, keeps things interesting. Now you repeat the original theme. Now you do another new theme, all right, one that you haven't heard before, completely new, theme C. Boom, repeat theme A. And then you could just continue for as many things, but the idea of rondo form is you have a primary theme or a chorus, and then a bunch of verses, each one with a completely different melody. The reason why this is popular in video game music, especially like Skyrim, Skyrim has several rondo form pieces of music, is because you can imagine, if you took a piece like written like this, and we'll say, we'll just add another D, like a D theme at the end. You take this and you repeat it, all right? Well, now you haven't heard this theme since it was played the first time. All right, the A theme might get a little boring here and there, but the C theme, again, you haven't heard this since this first time. And because you have themes that get used rarely, they don't, you only hear them once until the whole thing gets repeated, it keeps it sounding fresh. And the cool thing is you can use orchestration to make your A theme shift every time. Maybe the first time you hear the A theme, it's strings. All right, then the next A theme, you've got strings and woodwinds and maybe some percussion playing. Then the third time, boom, the brass take it over. You can have different arrangements 
It's just the thematic material. Remember, structure is just the number of different themes you use and the order in which they appear in your music. This is only one part of composing. You can do all kinds of stuff. Um, with arrangements, with changing keys, reharmonization, all kinds of stuff. Now, another source of structure is lyrics. In fact, this project I have right here is actually part of a soundtrack that I am composing. Right, I've been hired to do a uh, requiem for a stage production. All right, and so I have the lyrics that I was given. I was given a little bit of freedom. Uh, over these lyrics, the librettist has it typed out and everything. I, I had a conversation with him recently. We went deep into the story and what this particular song means, what the emotions he wants from it. So I got a lot of cool stuff from it. I've got my source of inspiration, but these are the main lyrics. All right, the Kyrie eleison, which this translates from Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. It is a traditional opening for requiems because the requiem is just the rite of Christian burial. It's a mass. Um... Uh, and then, um, so it has a traditional prayer, but this prayer takes on its particular meaning for the character of the story. And then there is an original poem. Now, the original poem, when I said I have a little bit of control over it, he, the librettist said I can duplicate things. So for this structure, I'm thinking the way I'm writing it, I'm actually going to, instead of repeating this last line twice, I'm going to repeat this one twice and then hit this one once. Uh, I'm getting off topic, though. I'm getting off topic. Um... Here we are. So, um, nope, these are my notes that I was talking about. Words, where is my, oh, this is why I don't click out of stuff. Uh, oh, it was on Cubase. That's right. So, lyrics can introduce your structure. That's probably what I, wa that's what I wanted to bring this up. So, for my lyrics, here we go. I know that the Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison, this is a structure. This is like part one. And this is broken into the first three four-bar phrases. All right, then the Christe eleison, that could be another section, but I like the idea, after the conversation I had with the writer, I want this to be more of a contrapuntal kind of motif coming throughout this section. Then I know this is a part, and then this is a section. So all of that, I don't know how useful that was or how much you were following on, but basically, moral of the story, you can get structure from lyrics. All right, and then the third source of structure that we will talk about is a story. So if you are, if you take the class that I have on my website, 100% free class, Tabletop uh, Music Academy, um, I have a class on melody writing. And the structures that you are taught in that class are based on a story. Find your story, and then each section of the music is a different scene or a different moment in the story. This is very common in film music, television music, anime music, video game music, any kind of media music that you want, where the structure of your music doesn't actually follow a traditional structure. Instead, every little bit about which theme to use where is informed by the story. In fact, this is something, it has its own name. It's called the principle of subordination. The idea that your music and the structure of your music are subordinate to the story that you're trying to tell, whether that's matching certain hit points in a scene or because like, oh, the bad guy's on the scene now. So now we need to switch to the bad guy's theme. Or things just went from happy to really sad, so now the overall mood needs to shift in the music. Whatever it is, your story determines the structure. So these are the basics. This is the solution. If you are stuck and you cannot move past your eight bars, you want to try practicing structure. All right? These are not cheat codes. These are not uh, cookie cutters. This is, you can consider it, the grammar of music. Even people who just do everything based off heart or inspiration. They just improvise everything. They are going to have structure, even if they don't know it. Because again, this is the way we hear music. Music theory was never invented before the music. All right, Music theory was always a way of explaining why things work. Structure exists because we understand why it works. It's all about patterns. All right? Specific structures can be invented, but the concept of structure cannot. It was... It was, it was it was put in practice already with music first. All right, so this is all well and good, right? You understand that if you want to practice, just start out, if you've got an eight bar melody, practice with a structure. Say, I'm gonna try A, A, B, A. So for this, I know I need to write an A theme and I need to write a B theme, all right? So that's what you do. You write your A theme, your primary theme, 
and then you write your B theme. It can be a completely new theme. It can be inspired or related to another theme, what have you. But you're going to need two different themes. Then all you do is literally just copy and paste them. All right, you got your A theme. Boom, copy and paste another A theme. All right, insert your B theme. Boom, copy and paste an A theme. This is just how you start. Of course, you can do things like modulation. You can reharmonize. You can tweak things. But if you are stuck at that eight bar idea, this is how you get out of it. You find a structure and you practice it. If you want to do something a little more complex, like I said, A theme, B theme, the rondo form. You need four different themes for this particular form. You can make it shorter and just have it be three, but it's up to you. Just pick a structure and practice. With your structure, identify how many themes you need and then the order they need to appear. Then once you've copied and pasted everything, then you can start tweaking. Then you can start making changes here and there. Now, that's all well and good, but how do you make secondary themes? All right, so there are two basic types we'll talk about today. There is a contrasting theme, and then there is a related theme. All right, so the contrasting theme, the whole point of a contrasting theme is it offers contrast. It's different. All right, so for this, it's pretty simple. The, the basic idea is you just identify the most important elements of your primary theme. What gives that theme its personality? You can think about things like harmony. It's written in a major key. All right, how do you contrast a major key? Let's swap to a minor key. Maybe you have mostly long notes. All right, awesome. How can you contrast mostly long notes? Work with some shorter notes, all right? Maybe you're mostly legato and very sing-songy kind of thing. Again, staccato, short, crisp, something contrasting. All right, all you do is you find a list of things that define the personality or have the biggest impact on the personality of your primary theme. Then you come up with a way to contrast it. So if you write your A theme, nice. B theme, you, so A theme is like major, key, large uh, leaps, and legato, very kind of stereotypical love, yeah, large like heroic love theme. All right, so then the B theme becomes much smaller. You make it much more, less about large leaps, more about small stepwise movement. You make it much more staccato. All right, then you repeat your A theme. Then you need to find a different way to contrast it with C theme. This is all hypothetical at the moment. We will do an example. Don't worry. Going theory, then examples. Um, a related theme, unlike the contrasting theme, the whole point is you're trying to create a secondary theme that sounds closely related to your primary theme. See how that works? Contrasting related it's in the name. Um, so with the related theme, the simplest strategy I've ever found is just find a couple interesting bars. All right. Say like whatever. Let's go to this melody that I have. All right. In fact, this is actually a good example. All right. So a related theme. All right. So here's my main theme. So then this technically isn't a brand new theme. It's just a repetition of the theme with some variation added. Oops. All right, I cannot play piano. Oh, it's an F sharp, that's why. All right, so if I were to say I need to create a new theme, I'd say, oh, awesome. Let's just pick this little idea. All right, I like that shape. I could say this is an idea I like. I think it's interesting. I'm going to copy and paste it. I'm going to pop it over here, and I'm going to use this as a new motif to build a brand new melody out of it. But because I took the idea from over here, they're going to feel related to certain levels. All right, so I'm not going to do that here because I don't want to mess up my sketch of this Kyrie. Um, but we'll do it. Let's do a quick question. All right, I'm going to do a quick break from theory, then I'll demonstrate stuff. Um, we'll do a quick demonstration of how to create both the contrasting themes and closely related themes. Uh, but for a moment, I'm going to take a drink. Throw your com questions in the comments. I'll address them real quick. Please keep them related. To this topic because you know that I tend to go on tangents um let me take a drink all right 
Number 23. Oh, sweet. This is the subject I was curious about. Awesome. Wonderful. Uh, Leaf, hey, just wanted to say congrats and thank you. I thought I was never going to wrap my head around these elements of music theory, and I've already learned so much. That's awesome. That makes me super excited to hear when people just genuinely find me useful, all right? Because like I said, I've had such kind of a rocky background with music education myself, so being able to help clear some hurdles for people is really like the whole point of this. So thank you, Leaf. You, you give me a lot of motivation when I hear stuff like that, so thank you. Zeld Z, hello, maybe just Zelds. Um, welcome. Uh, 23, I'm 100% behind this method of lesson priority. Yes, uh, I figured people would be. All right, Zelds, thank you so much. This is beyond useful. My pleasure. All right, awesome. So, not seeing any more questions. So, let's get back to the lesson. We're going to do a quick example, and then we will, um, and then we'll just open it up to Q&A, shall we? All right, so I'm going to duplicate this track. I'm going to bring it down here. Because I don't want to mess. In fact, you know what? I'm going to make both of these invisible so I don't mess with them. Actually, no, I'm going to make them invisible. i got to mute them first. All right, so here is my primary theme. All right, we're going to go with, in fact, we will delete this first half. Actually, no, we'll leave it. Let's listen to the full theme. This one was written, again, the Kyrie. Awesome. So we've got a great kind of like main theme to work with here. So first, let's create a contrasting theme. All right. Remember what we talked about. A contrasting theme is, again, the whole point is it's supposed to offer contrast. So for this, we want to start out by identifying the elements of this theme that make it so, that like gives it a personality, basically. So right off the bat, this key is, this piece is in the key of A minor second I've got to select this there we go so we got a minor then we've got a G sus 2 then we've got an F major then we've got an E sus 4 all right so very this right here the E sus 2 the E to a minor that's how we know we're in the key of e ma a minor all right, that sound, E major to A minor, that's a very stereotypical minor sound. Major five to minor one. If you don't know what I'm talking about, again, enroll in my free class, Harmony for Composers. It's, um, again, one little thing for the people who are new. Go to tabletopcomposer.com. Go to Academy. Learn about my reasons for doing this if you'd like, but... Four free classes. Music Theory and Harmony 1 will give you a fa fantastic foundation in music theory for chords and everything taught in my signature style. Uh, so yeah, anywho, right off the bat, this is an A minor, all right? Something else I'm noticing, the melody moves downward, all right? That's all I need, all right? I could keep going, create all kinds of stuff I, if I wanted to, but I'm going to say instead of doing a minor key and a downward moving melody, Let's just do a major key, or at least major chord harmony, an upward moving melody. All right, so let's try. We do E major, E dominant seven. Let's do an F major. A nice deceptive resolution. That's what that's called. Ugh. So that we'll do F major, G major, it was, and then it was an E minor. And we'll do a D major. I, 
like that sound. So we do F major, G major, E minor, and then D major. All right, and so we're not gonna write a full melody. We're just gonna get the idea of an upward moving melody. So what we're gonna do is to create a simple melody. Let's bring this in a little bit. Um, I'm just gonna pick two chordal tones over each chord and create a general shape of my melody. Then we'll go up to C. Then we'll do B, G, and then we'll do, um, let's do B and then E. Then we'll do F sharp and then D. All right, so now we have bring these down a little bit this is a short little four bar idea all I'm gonna do here is I'm going to add a little bit of embellishments again if you would like to learn more about the strategies and tools I'm using to write a melody so quickly, again, take my class, Melody for Composers. This, if you want to be a media composer, this is a crucial skill to develop, the ability to work quickly, all right? As a media composer, you are often expected to write an amazing, inconceivable amount of music in a ridiculously short time period. So you can't wait for inspiration. You can't wait for writer's block to get over. You need to get to work. And not only do you need to get to work, but you need to be able to write stuff that works, that feels impactful, all right? So the way I like to put it is music theory is very useful as a bunch of tools. So my cousin is a woodworker, all right? He's a beautifully skilled carpenter. I'm very jealous of him. If we were to both go into his awesome workshop with all the tools he's amassed over the years that he's done this, could I do something? I'd like to think I could. I could probably put together a little like a boat or something, nothing that looks like a boat, but something that could go in water and float. Not for me, but for like a toy boat or something. I don't know. I could do something. I could come up with something, but I'm not going to know how to use any of his tools. So I have to figure it out by myself. I have to stumble around and figure out, oh, this tool is really good for this, this tool helpful for this. Sometimes I'm going to come up with really creative uses for tools that he won't be able to come up with because he has a fixed idea of how something works. That's something cool about that. But if we were to go in there, and we were to have a competition over who could create something awesome, he's going to beat me every single time because the hundreds of tools in his workshop, he picked every single one of them. He knows how each of them work. He knows what they're good at. He knows what they're used for. He'll be able to do what, he'll be able to make a whole bunch of things before I can even piece together a single idea because he knows how to use the tools. And most importantly, when he has an image in his head of what he wants to create, he has specific strategies on how to do it. Music is the same. Music theory, there's a lot of people lately, especially on the comments for my videos, it's been getting really big, people who are very against music theory, and that's fine. It's not for everybody. But if you want to be a media composer, you have to understand the, some kind of tools because you have to be able to have an image in your head of, oh, I need to create a piece of music that impacts the audience like this. And you have to immediately have at least ideas of how you're going to do that. And if the director says it's not impactful, you need to do something else. You have to be able to hit the ground running and be able to come up with something very quickly. All right, so that's kind of me and my uh, soapbox. The whole analogy, music theory, knowing your music theory is like being my cousin. Not knowing your music theory is like being me in his work workshop. All right, neither one is terrible. It's awesome either way, but it's just... If you have those tools and you know how to use them, you can bring your vision to life a lot more easily than just stumbling around on the keyboard. Nothing wrong with that, but again, if you want to meet deadlines, if you want this to be your job, you better be able to use those tools. All right, anyways, so what I'm doing here is I've got uh, uh, my basic tools here. And then I'm just kind of bridging it here. Um, 
no, G wouldn't work. It works as a melody, but it doesn't work with the harmony underneath. All right, so let's hear this. Super short, super simple idea. Let's listen to our primary theme one more time and then hear the response. In fact, it sounds a little too similar. So something I might do is I'm like, all right, let's just add more movement. So we might do. All right, so yeah, basic idea, you're seeing all this kind of stuff. That's how you can very quickly do a contrasting theme. And again, if I had my structure, I thought A theme, all right, I need an A theme. B theme, do I want it to be a related theme or do I want it to be a contrasting theme? All right, if it's a contrasting theme, start out, like I said, pick two, three, four things maximum is all you need, or minimum, I should say, two things minimum that have to do with the uh, personality of the first theme. And then just come up with a game plan to kind of subvert that off add contrast um so then we could do a related theme all right so if i want if i liked this idea of the i could just say all right i'm gonna use the same motif but i'm gonna build a brand new melody from it all right or if i say i want something interesting like maybe this bar i think is really cool build a new melody from that and again it's going to feel related because i took the motif the primary motif from this melody in fact let's just do that let's do uh we have and we'll do uh da, 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 Here we go. I took this little motif, literally just ripped it from the previous melody, and I've got a new melody. And again, I can toy with it. I can change it. I can do all kinds of cool things. But uh, yeah, I think that's that's it 34 minutes 34 minutes on this first initial lesson any questions um i think that went pretty smoothly oops what did i just click no i don't want to play this right now now you guys know which games i play or just one that's like, honestly that's the only game i have on this computer at the moment i used to have a bunch of steam games i still own a bunch of steam games but the only game that I've been playing recently is Star Wars Old Republic. I haven't actually played it for like a month, but I got really into it. I had my, I because I, I revisited back in college. It was one of the few games that I actually put money into, and so I had it was really fun going back to a bunch of older characters I had forgotten about that I had like maxed the level out on. It was it was a lot of fun, uh, and so it was just fun redoing like the storyline and stuff. Um, I like playing as a Sith in that game because they have cooler powers, but I always feel guilty doing evil things. So I always end up being like a Sith who's on the light side. I don't know. The game mechanics hate me because I'm a Sith in name only in those games, but I get to use force lightning, which is cool. Um, yeah. So yeah, that was the lesson. Hopefully that was helpful. 
now the floor is open to Q and A. All right. I am excited. Yeah, let's hear some questions. Anything music related, etc. Requests for videos, topics, anything. Uh, let's delete this. Let's bring these back. Let's unmute them because I don't want to lose any of this. Oh, well, yeah. Let's see here. So I'm going to go through here. Let's see here. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, Raycon, I'm so glad, grateful I found this channel. Thank you. I'm glad you did too. I am really grateful to have so many people finding this channel recently. I think I got like 3,000 new subscribers this past month, which was insane. Still is insane. I, I love meeting new people. I love seeing so many different names in the chat on the streams. I mean, I love seeing the regulars too. All right. Jack, Matt, Visme, to, uh, who's also Tamashi. I love seeing uh, so many people who come back. Thank you very much. Um, but it's really cool seeing new faces too. All right. Uh, let's see here. Joao, what is it that A and B implying? What is that A and B implying? Oh, you mean in this? So you must have come late. So notepad. Uh, this is just, I was talking about structure. All right. So structure is the number of different themes that you use and the order in which they appear in your music. So the A and B, this is like A theme, your first theme. You repeat it, then a B theme, something new, a different theme, contrasting or related, whatever it is. And then you repeat your A theme. This is a very common structure. And again, you can Google common song structures, common concert music structures, all that kind of stuff. It'll help you. This is how you kind of get past that eight bar rut. You have to have an idea of where you're going with your music. Uh, then, of course, the C theme, that's its own theme. D theme, that's its own. This is Rondo form. Um, and I said there are three very, there, these aren't the only ones, but three very common sources of structure are just traditional structures. Whether these are song structures, it's a concert music structure like um, Rondo form or Sonata form or a fugue, what have you. Um, then if you're working with lyrics, lyrics can give you the structure as well. And then in media composing the story the story dictates your form as a film composer you do not get to choose entirely the form of your music in terms of like you don't want to have the idea of like oh i'm going to use these themes as a a b a when that doesn't work with the underlying story all right the idea that your structure in a soundtrack should always be informed by what's happening in the story is called the principle of subordination all right so that's what that means um Oh, the EAB chord. Sorry, I probably should have kept writing. All right, so the EAB chord, I this is in here. Where is it? EAB. All right, so this is an E sus4. It would be helpful if my keyboard would cooperate. All right, so E A B. This is an A sus4. All right, so typically, let's just go over here. You have tertian harmony, all right? Chords built in thirds. So you would typically have E major. Now, if you take this third note, so you add the first, skip the second note in the scale, add the third, skip the fourth note in the scale, and then add the fifth. That's how you create chords. Again, if you watch, um, if you enroll in my free online class, Harmony for Composers, you'll learn all of this. But a sus chord basically says, all right, let's get rid of the three and instead let's add the four all right so you get a sus four all right these typically want to resolve by taking the a and then returning to the third very common another option that you can have is instead of adding the four you can add the two oops that's right in this key of e major that would be an f major i apologize and again it wants to resolve in the same way now the cool thing is if you are if you've seen like my idea my lectures on character themes or anything on emotion if you've taken my emotions to music class you know that i try to be very deliberate with the way i tell stories with my music just small little inspiration it's called a musical gesture when something about the story informs or inspires just any decision you make with the music. In this case, even though the E sus4 would typically want to resolve to E major, I want to deny it, all right? This entire story that I'm writing the Requiem for, 
um, is built around this idea of someone who really needs to move on from something in their past, right? They, they hold themselves guilty for a tragedy that happened in their life. They carry a lot of guilt and shame surrounding it. And their entire life, they kind of want a release from it. But the, funnily enough, the person, the only person refusing to let them move on is themselves. So that's the main thing for my harmony that I really want to do is I want to play with the idea of refusing to resolve my harmony the way it normally would. So instead of going E sus4 to E major, I go E sus4 to E A minor. So if you look over here again, E sus4, so we had the E sus4, we have, this would normally want to resolve like that. But in my kind of running theme of denying, of refusing to allow the resolution that it wants, instead of moving this note, I move this one and create an A minor. All right. So again, that just kind of goes with the story, the idea that this character holds themselves guilty for a great tragedy in their past. And the only reason why they can't move on is they can't let themselves move on. They can't let go of that guilt. They can't help get, let go of that shame. So actually, really cool idea about like the lyrics. Like I said, I was writing about this. This is a Kyrie. The idea of the Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. Christe eleison, Christ have mercy. This is a requiem. These are traditional prayers, traditional things associated with the uh, requiem. And but this was chosen to kickstart with this main idea of the character is begging for mercy again with the repetition of the Christ day of there's Christ have mercy Christ have mercy Christ have mercy they're begging for mercy but they won't allow themselves to move on they could be forgiven right no one holds them accountable for what happened in their past no one does except for them and they are the only reason why they can't move back on and that's that's kind of a running motif that's just one character but a lot of the characters in the story have something that they're seeking something that they want which all stories do all stories have a character who wants something but the running motif of this is that the people that are in their way is just themselves. So that's just kind of a cool thing that I'm geeking out over about like my own genius kind of thing. I know some of you could probably very quickly humble me. Um, but no, yeah, they're just, you know, yeah, have fun, right? And so my idea of if he's the one denying himself peace, if he's the one denying res resolution from this great tragedy, I want the music to reflect that. And I want it to refuse to resolve in traditional ways. Um, same way that actually with this, I also, instead of going E major back to A minor, like it's supposed to, or I go from E major to F major. Again, something non-traditional, something unexpected, a refusal to resolve the way it would normally resolve. All right. So yeah, you got me kind of monologuing there, Joao, with just that one question. But thank you. I like to talk about my music. I don't. Do, that's one thing. I need to do that more. I don't really talk about my own music that much on this channel. It's mostly just an educational kind of thing. Um. I'll say so. Ronin's realm. Hey man, are you able to turn your microphone up a bit? Yeah, no problem. Sorry, I probably should have done that. In fact, uh, yeah. Does that help a little? I apologize. I'm using a different mic setup today because I was recording some stuff. Uh, normally on my streams, I have a compressor set up to kind of uh boost my volume so i apologize for that oh, yeah i apologize i probably should have read that sooner um let's see the amazing basin <laughs> heck yeah i've been wanting to catch a live session for a while welcome awesome i'm glad you made it leaf question for after the lesson is voice leading the same as choosing inversions of chords that have common tones and reduce movement um very good question so Inversions, yes, voice leading is basically just trying to minimize the amount of movement, and it is optional, depending on the genre you're writing. But voice leading, so if I were to voice lead chords, there's a couple more rules behind it, but if you want to learn like the actual rules, again, take my class. Let's just do C major, D minor, we'll do F major, C major. Very simple chord progression. So, Voice leading would say try to eliminate the most movement as possible without having parallel fits. So to do that, common tones stay in the same voice. And then typically you would try to avoid, we would just drop this down here, drop these. And again, if you want to know these specific reasons why, 
you can let's do no let's just yeah stick this yeah if you wanted to learn specific reasons why you could just take the class i'm actually going to move this up here i don't care about the traditional ideas but just it's smooth the idea is you want to each line to sound like a distinct line or that it sounds like it could be played by an instrument and nice and smooth rather than being super blocky in which case the emphasis is on the chords and not the individual lines whereas if we go it sounds like it's kind of it'll acquire things now inversions are something else inversions have to deal with the roots which note is in your bass line? And that's literally the only thing it happens to do. I have gotten so many rude comments on YouTube about claiming this. That in an inversion, all it has to do is with what notes in the bass line. All right, so this is root position C. If I were to change this to a G down here, this is second inversion C. Doesn't matter if these up here are not inverted because the G is in the bass line, this is a second inversion. The reason why so many people get confused is because inversions have often been taught using a method called figured bass. Figured bass was a type of notation that was invented for the harpsichord, the ancestor of the modern day piano. Now it is a very useful tool for teaching inversions, but it's got this idea that you have to have inversions in certain orders. The chords have to follow in a certain order. But if that were the case, inversions would be useless or next to useless for orchestral music because you couldn't do proper voice leading. You couldn't properly do chord voicings for like assigning into instrument choice. There's all kinds of things that would be an issue. You couldn't have the proper chord tone weighting. There's all kinds of things. So I get kind of worked up about this, but the main idea is if anyone ever tells you that the only thing that like this that this is a C major, non-inverted, and it, the only way to make it second inversion would be to raise these, and these upper voices have to appear in this order. No, that's nonsense. The only thing that determines it is the note in the bass. I once had someone very rude tell me to go open a textbook and that I'm a disgrace and I don't deserve to call myself a music teacher if I can't get this one little thing right. Told me to check a textbook. I've got like seven textbooks on the uh, bookshelf behind me. Checked every single one of them. Not a single author contradicted my example. They all just said that an inversion is dependent on the note in the bass. The examples they give are traditional kind of figured bass, but none of them said that the upper voices have to appear in this order. All right, that goes with Tchaikovsky on his book on harmony. It went with the books from Berkeley, the Berkeley Press. It went with all the books from Routledge, all kinds of cool things. I'm getting all carried away. All that to say, well, you know what I'm saying. All right, so let's see here. I'm getting carried away here. Um, what's, let's see here. Mm, where was I? Where was I? All right, so Ronan's, yes, Leaf, essentially. Um, oh, yeah, awesome. So, yeah, Ronan answered Leaf. Thank you. Um, Zelds, it may sound stupid, but when is it best to use legato between strings? Like, add that swing legato sound. That, not stupid. It's completely up to you. But as a general rule, the more forceful, and energetic that you want it to sound, the more like distinct you want, the more staccato and more broken things you should have, the more lyrical, the more melodic and kind of emotional, the more legato you should use. Really, don't overthink it. Don't try to over-intellectualize it. Just feel it. And, okay, that's so... I, I hate it when people say just feel it because I know it's not the most helpful advice. It's important advice, but it's not the most helpful. So I would say sing through your melody. All right, sing through your melody, and any time you feel that notes should be connected, legato. Any times they shouldn't, keep them broken. Now, that being said, strings do have specific rules with legato because when they're slurred together, they're at one bow movement, so you can mess stuff up a little bit. But that'll be something that, again, you can learn more about by taking my classes. Let's see here. Uh, 23, not only do I come back, I'm going to watch the video over again. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. That helps a lot. YouTube loves to see people re-watching. All right, that's a great thing. Yeah, things you can do to help your favorite YouTubers. Um, watch the full video, all right? View percentage is a big thing, all right? Um, comment, even if it's just an emoji or thumbs up or something. Um, 
YouTube loves engagement. And then of course, share, all right? Even if you don't actually share it, clicking the share button and then clicking copy link, YouTube loves that. YouTube loves to say, oh, people are talking about this. They're pushing it in other places. That's great. Those are great things that you can do because YouTube will go, oh, if people like it, I'm gonna push it in front of more people. Let's see here. Jack, when you have time, I'd love to see another song analysis videos. Those are great to learn structure and arrangement. Oh, very much. Uh, so are you talking about like the learn by listening videos or my studio Ghibli uh, videos? Um, Cause yeah, I would, I would, I think it'd be fun to do some analysis videos. The only issue is those get demonetized like immediately. Um, yeah, YouTube does not like it when you use music in your videos that you didn't write. Um, let's see here. I mean, you learn. By oh yeah, learn. Yeah, so yeah, learn by lessons. Awesome. Yeah, I would be. I'd totally be up for it. I'd be fired. Uh, e sus. <laughs> what? E sus. Uh, twenty three. Um. Oh no. Yeah. E sus. You were the one who was asking about the. No. No. Joao was asking about that. Huh. Not sure. Uh, Zelds. My I add not just strings but brass and woodwinds. So overall. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I think I answered that hopefully in a useful way. Um. Awesome. The volume boost helped. Uh, that cleared up a bit. Um, let's see. Remember, anytime you encounter a rule which demands you must do this or you must not do that, most likely the described rule applies to that specific musical system or paradigm and not to everything. Yes, very, 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 very much true. All right, there are no laws of music. Um, well, I mean, there are laws about like acoustics, sure, but musical theory has no specific laws that cannot be broken. In fact, if there were rules that could not be broken, we wouldn't really have a lot of fun with it, right? We wouldn't be... The whole idea is how creatively you can use different rules and stuff. Oh, uh, but yeah, so wise word, Sinide 2020. Thank you. And then 23. So legato is good for singy, catchy parts, basically. That adds up. Yeah, pretty much. Legato is helpful for kind of... This is a very generalized description, but legato is very good for lyrical parts. All right, if you want something to be something to be sung and kind of melodic and lyrical, then yes, legato is great. If you want something to be crisper, more bouncy, more energetic, more high energy, staccato and detaché work really well. Again, those are highly generalized, but helpful nonetheless. And look at that. I'm all caught up. Uh-oh, I'm seeing buffering. Is, is the stream dead? Is it buffering? What's going on here? It says I have an excellent connection. What's going on, people? All right, so I'm seeing people like it. I'm seeing likes come through. Thank you. Um, Welcome, Alex. Welcome. All right. It says it's buffering. Oh, thank you, guys. I'm seeing all the hearts come through. Um, Can people see? Howdy. Howdy. Um, Can people still see? Okay, so it looks like it's coming in. It says it's got excellent connection, but now I'm seeing buffering. I don't know. Um, little bit of stuttering. That's unfortunate. Um, all right, awesome. So, thank you, people. Thank you. I'm getting all kind of cool things in the comments. All right. Um, awesome. So, I'm a lot of questions at this point. Anyone have any other questions you want me to answer? If not, um, like I said, this is just a piece from the new soundtrack that I'm sketching out. Um, yeah. So, everybody excited about the Christmas holiday season? I know if people are new, at the beginning I was talking about how I've been cooking all week. So this year I'm doing homemade gifts. Uh, and so I'm making a bunch of family recipes. I've got like seven dozen tortillas in the freezer right now that I've been making all week. I've got a couple more dozen to make because I come from a big family. Um, i got nine pounds of chorizo that I'm cooking. And I've got, I think, like four pounds dry of frijoles, like dry beans. They were four pounds. So I think that's going to come out to like eight pounds. I think it doubles uh, of total beans that I've been making. So I'm excited to see everybody. All right, Raycon, do you have a Discord? If not, would love to help out with it. I do. I do have a Discord. It's not very active. Um, but the best way to do it, because I'm not very, I, I don't know a lot about Discord, but I do have one. The best way, go to Academy, sign up for one of the classes. All right, each of these classes, if you sign up for them, they're 100% free. I don't make money off of this other than anything but people who take the class, finish it, and think, awesome, I want to donate, which is cool. You can do that too. Um, sign up. They come with a link to the Discord channel that you can find. And sign up. You can meet with people. It's really cool. Um, if this is your first time seeing this, yes, I launched this, what, two days ago, the 20th? This is a long-time goal, a long-time dream of mine. I'm kind of proud of this little 
logo. I made this myself. Um, yeah, I like it. Um, anyway, yeah, so it's Tabletop Academy, Fee Music Education. Right now I have four classes I've put together. Uh, each of them, the whole idea, they had, one covers harmony music theory, one about melody in music theory and how it can be helpful. Talk about that analogy I talked about earlier about knowing how to use the tools in your workshop. And then two on orchestration. Check them out. They're really cool. 100% free. There are no hidden thoughts, costs. You will never be told to pay for something. But if you would like to pay for something, uh, just make a donation. That's available as well. And if you, there are, I do have a class that you can pay for. Um, oh, this is supposed to be closed. You're not supposed to be enrolled. We're in a current cohort. Um, yeah, so don't sign up for this right now. We're in the middle of a class. Um, but yeah, so down the line, if you'd like, you can pay for that. And then the bookshop. I've got lots of ebooks and stuff that I've put together. I had a very flattering email or like message on Instagram where someone got this particular book, my book on storytelling with music. And someone told me that it was almost like a religious experience, the way that everything clicked and made sense. And it was a new perspective to approach music. So very flattering. I really appreciated that. Oh, uh, yeah. Awesome. So check that out. Stuff. So that's how you can do stuff. Um, Let's see here. We have a Discord. So, yeah, so that was it. Alex and congrats on the free composing class. Thank you. Didn't check it out yet, but I will after the stream. Awesome. Yes, please do. I really get a kick out of every time I get a message on my phone that says, someone signed up for the class. Um, so I'm super excited about that. Thank you. Uh, 23, yum, I love chorizo. Been using it in hash browns for breakfast. Oh, yes, chorizo is amazing. I am making a beef chorizo this year, actually. Traditionally, chorizo is made from pork, uh, but pork is expensive for some reason in the area I live right now. So I just found a super fatty kind of, I think it's like 73% lean beef so super fatty which is good that's what you want for chorizo i'm making that i right before the stream i was i think it was like i had uh cut and de-seeded like 46 chili peppers like dried it's like uh chile anchos and then chile pasillas are what i use for my chorizo so next i gotta go bake those make them nice and crispy grind them into some homemade chili powder and then i've got a whole bunch of other stuff to make for the chorizo um, I actually could do a series of it. I'm not going to do it because this is a music channel, but I, I have a bunch of Mexican food recipes that I could share. I am particularly proud of my tortilla recipe. All right. I'm going to say that no one in my family since my abuelita passed makes tortillas like I do. All right. And that's because I have spent countless hours making them. And in the last year or two of her life, I was one of the caretakers for my abuelita. So every time I would spend a day with her, I would, well, I had to help her cook. And so she taught me how to do her tortillas her way. And so I can troubleshoot any issue with your tortillas. Uh, and a lot of my family will ask, like, oh, but the tortillas are coming out too hard. Or they're not coming out the right way or whatever. I can troubleshoot any issue with tortillas. I'm very proud of that. I can tell you exactly what you're doing, where in the process that's going wrong, and what little tweaks you can do to fix it to get that perfect, just kind of soft, chewy, warm, mm, just emotional experience for food um <laughs> live cooking yes uh no i'm not gonna i wouldn't do that uh it's it's a different channel if maybe for like a 30 30k if anyone's interested i'm gonna be careful because i mentioned in a stream once that i would do a 20k voice reveal and tamashi one of the regulars in the chat sniped me on that and he reminded me but if anyone is interested for 30k subscribers i will do a tortilla recipe i will teach you how to make the best tortillas you have ever had in your life all right let's see here um sin i 2020 um oh it really is it, i do think it's the best food on earth uh alex thank you i'm glad you like the logo me too i i, I really enjoy it uh I, i'm i'm proud of it i should say um so leaf what is your spice blend for chorizo uh, so i use ancho chiles uh pasilla chiles i use ground coriander ground ginger ground cumin I use um, garlic, obviously, salt, obviously, a bit of apple cider vinegar, and I know, I know, oh, uh, paprika, paprika, and I know I'm missing something, but I can't remember. I'm missing something, but those are those are the base for my chorizo. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see. Let's see, what's your spice blend for I'm cooking? Uh, Sinaid, what level of musical knowledge your class is geared towards? Complete novice. All right, so, yeah, so they're based, the current ones I have right now are based on the ground up. 
All right. So the order I recommend, if you are someone who has loves writing music but has zero music theory knowledge, I recommend watching taking the harmony class first, then going to the melody class, and then each of the orchestration classes. If you do that, you will go from zero music theory knowledge to a very strong foundation. All right. I that's my guarantee. All right. My guarantee is you take those classes. Those are good classes. All right. This is not me being prideful. That is me being like, that was my goal. All right. That's what I wanted. I set out to make good classes because I, I have a, a vendetta against music education because of whole kind of personal experiences. And so I want to create, if you go on the website, I actually have a breakdown of like the three phases I have. And the final phase for this class, if it gets to that level, I want to get accredited by the U.S. Department of Education, meaning that I want it to be basically college credit worthy and still free. Because I want this, in long term, I have no idea if it'll get there, but I'm putting it out there. That's what I want. I want the Tabletop Academy to become an alternative to music college. That people can say, hey, I do not have 10 grand to spend every month for a music education. I'm going to go do this free, awesome option instead. Uh, so that's the goal. Um, let's see here. Uh, Zelds, bro, multi-talented. Yes, you know it. Um, let's see here. Alex, I just, uh, <laughs> Jack saying I should have a second food channel. They, that's the thing. I know I'm good at a couple recipes. I do a couple recipes really well, but I don't have, if I were to do a second channel, I'd probably be exploring different recipes. I'd start off with the ones I'm really good at. I can make a really good tres leches. I can make amazing tortillas. I've got good, uh, chorizo. I can make conchas very well. Um, I'm very good at making beans and rice. Rice, I can make those six things I can make very well. Other than that, I'm kind of mid. Because uh, I have, just haven't explored any other that much. Um, uh, <laughs> 23. I'm into the second channel cooking. I, you must know about these tortillas. All right, if you want to know more about tortillas, you know what to do. 30,000. If I get to 30,000 subscribers, I will do a whole like family secrets revealed. I will go step by step. I will treat it just like the music theory. I will say, if you're running into this issue, here's how you fix it. Here's the perfect step for tortillas. That's what I'll do. Uh, 30,000 first though. Let's see. Alex, I just joined the stream, so I'm not sure if my questions already got covered. I really like to make music that develops and sometimes changes completely unexpectedly. Let's say you have an eight bars and a half. Uh, no, that's one half. And then your other half is down here with all the layers from the peak of the song. How would you try to come up with another eight bars that are different from the first, but still blended good enough? That is exactly what I was talking about. So awesome. No worries. I won't repeat all of it right now, but if when the stream is done, go back to the beginning. I'm going to walk you through everything. We'll start with a discussion on structure and how structure is the key to writing a full length piece of music and how you can come up with a cool structure for your music. And then we will talk about the two types of secondary themes you can work with. One, like you said, having a uh, contrasting idea where it seems like a completely new idea that still fits or a related idea where you take inspiration from your primary theme but create a brand new theme. Yeah, we talk about all of that, all right? And I also talk about it in my class on melody writing. So again, check it out. Um, let's see here. Uh, so that was the first half. Met composer interviews and music feedback streams and congrats on the course. I would love to do that. I do want to do that. I did one interview video with uh, Zach Heidi. I had a lot of fun. Uh, I've got a list of different composers I would like to interview. Right now, I'm in a bit of a busy season. I've got two soundtracks that I'm working on. And uh, one of them is tied to a really cool project that I am doing with the Indie Film Music Contest. All right, I'm not going to say much at the moment, but if you know what I've done with them in the past, you've got a pretty good idea of what's coming up. All right. It's just cool. Uh, let's see here. Um, so yeah, I would love to do more interviews. I have, I have a podcast actually. We haven't released any new videos in a while, but if you go to Spotify, actually, let me pull this up. Um, let's see here. Sitting at the table. Yeah. If you go here, Sitting at the table, it's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on, um, I think, Audibles, it's on all kinds of stuff. Um, but this is just me and my friend, me and my roommate, Antonio. He, We've got a kind of interesting dynamic uh, where I am a trained therapist, that's what I went to school for, and then, oddly enough, I'm a professional musician instead, where he was a very classically trained, like one of those people who starts piano at the age of four, um... 
And now he's a professional therapist. So we both have like a passion for music. We both have a passion for films. And so we just take films and break them down. If you want to watch it on YouTube, because, but YouTube, we, we can't really do it on YouTube anymore. Um, let's see here. You guys are seeing the stuff I watch. Uh, let's see here. Where is, no, not the studio. Where's my channel? Oh, view your channel. Uh, if you go here, go to playlists. Uh, right here. Yeah. We've got them on here. We can't really do it on YouTube, though, because YouTube was, like, banning half of them. I tried uploading the Princess Mononoke episode, like, five different times, and it denied me every single time. Um, but, yeah, you can watch it here. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of cool stuff. I want to do more like that. And I want to invite guests onto the podcast where we talk about films, talk about different concepts and stuff. So, yeah, I am all over that, Matt. Just a matter of, like, uh, timing and my schedule. Uh, honestly... I could really use with an assistant for this channel. I don't have the money for an assistant, but someday, someday I would like to just have someone handle a lot of this for me. Oh, let's see here. Jack, my grandmother took all her recipes to her grave. Ah, <laughs> oh man, that is a bummer. That does suck. I don't know. It was tricky. So actually, little story time. The reason why no one else in the family, I think I have like one other relative who knows the recipe for my abuelita. It's because she was from that generation where she didn't write down her recipes. She just threw stuff in. It was amazing to watch the woman at work. She would just go with the bag of flour, toss in however much. That's good. Then she'd go to like the Crisco can and just pop in all the vegetable shortening that she thought. That's good. And she could always just feel by the texture of the dough what it was missing. And I feel I like to feel I'm at that point now too. I'm, I'm, I am I'm have got to the point where I can tell when I'm kneading the dough what it needs. I can tell it's like, oh. This needs more water, or this needs more oil, this needs more whatever. But the way I found it out was I bought all new ingredients. All right, brand new bag of flour, brand new thing of shortening, brand new thing of baking powder, brand new thing of everything, all right? And then I had her, I measured all of them on a scale, like on a food scale. How heavy is this bag of flour? How heavy is this thing in Crisco? All of it. Then I had her show me making a batch of tortillas, and then I took all the ingredients back and I remeasured them to find out how much was missing from each one. That's how I got the ratios. And I am happy to inform that the ratios were no different from any recipe that you look online. All right, it was still it was still thirds, three cups of flour, one cup of water, um, a third cup of your shortening, whatever you want, and then just a teaspoon of baking powder. Then salt if you want it. And it wasn't until lots of practice that I realized the recipe isn't so much what's as important with tortillas. It's how you cook and prepare. It's very detailed work on how long to cook it, what you do with it, what it's not cooked. There's a lot of little things that you do here, like heat. It was a lot of like nitpicking. Uh, there are, of course, you got to be able to adjust the recipe. So if the, if the flour is starting to, if the dough is starting to like break in certain points, it needs more water. You want a nice, stretchy, malleable dough. Uh, different tricks on how to get round tortillas instead of weird little blob things. And I'm going off on a tangent kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's a story. A story. Yes. Yes. 30K. 30K subscribers, I will do this. All right. I will teach you. I will take you to my kitchen or maybe go to a friend's house who has a nicer kitchen than me. And I will record and I will show you guys how to do this. All right. Let's see here. Um, Sinai 2020. By the way, it's sign, like sine wave, pronounced like sign. Oh, awesome. Thank you. I think, was I pronouncing it sin earlier? I don't know. Um, no big deal. I apologize. Now it's sinai. There we go. Sinai. All right, that sounds, uh, sinai. All right, yep. Uh, Alex, next question. Let's say you have eight bars of chords. How would you enhance it, for example, with transition chords or strip it down to create development? Ah, so now you're asking about reharmonization, which is a topic that's broad enough that I actually have plans to do an entire class dedicated to reharmonization. How do you take a chord progression and create all kinds of cool things with it? How do you enhance it? Because that's really what a lot of my approach is. I will always start with just a super simple chord progression. Just something basic that helps tell the story. It sets the mood. And then once I have my melody, that's when I start doing kind of cool stuff with it and souping it up and creating all kinds of weird things. So unfortunately, that's not something I can really answer in just one a couple minutes. But that would be a good topic for a future stream. So when I make my announcement for my next stream, pop it in the comments. Remind me, it'd be cool to learn about a couple different reharmonization strategies. There are several I can teach you and they're all really cool. Let's see here. Uh, it doesn't really fit in the topic, but what's your opinion on using AI tools to create music? For example, I use ChatGPT to help me find single chords or a chord progression I couldn't resolve myself. Um, I'll say I use ChatGPT. 
I do not use it to write my music. All right. I just have no need for it. But what I do use it for is studying genres. All right. So if you have the right kind of questions, you can learn all about different kind of genres. You ask, all right, I want to learn what are some harmonic devices common in folk music, for example. You can look down there. It gives you a couple ideas and then you can straighten things up. I will use ChatGPT basically as a research assignment, uh, uh, assistant. If I need help putting together a harmonic language to match a certain genre, I'll use ChatGPT to put that kind of stuff together. So it is a useful tool. It's like a search engine. But no, personally, I wouldn't use it for music. If you need to, go for it. I don't really have anything against it. Uh, I would say that the goal should be to move past it, though. That to start studying your theory, start studying, start practicing, and get to the point where you don't need ChatGPT to tell you what to do next. Because you should be able to have the tools available to have ideas of which directions to go in. And, and a good ear to hear, yeah, I like the way that sounds. All right, so don't let it become a crutch. But as a useful tool for training, I'm all for it. Let's see here. And Matt, is there a new Discord or is it the same one? Same one, just different channels. So like if you're a patron, patrons have had access to the Discord for a long time. There's still a patron-only section on the Discord channel. Not very active. Like I said, the Discord channel hasn't been active for a while. Um, but yes, there I've just added new like chat things. I don't know. I'm not good with Discord. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of chat groups or whatever for each of the classes where you can put your homework assignments. You can ask for feedback. You can ask questions. You can... Just kind of interact with the other students. Um, yeah, awesome. So that, I think that brings us to the end of the stream. Good questions, everybody. So thank you so much to everybody who was online. I wish all of you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday season. I think I've got one more stream I'm going to try to do before the new year. All right, so the next one will be the last stream of the year. And... Yeah, check out my new free, 100% free online music school. Check it out. Spread the word, all right? That's, I, I want this to help as many people as possible. So spread the word, post it in forums, subreddits, anywhere you think people would find it useful. It'd be awesome. Thank you. And yeah, I'm going to go get back to cooking an ungodly amount of Mexican food. So I'll see you all. And yeah, see you next week. Have a good one, everybody. Merry Christmas.